All right. Well, it's 11 o'clock. I think we'll have a couple more people uh, streaming in as we get started, but I wanted to uh, begin the webinar on the inventory of moderate and intensive timber clearings detected via remote sensing in New Hampshire between 2000 and 2018. Uh, this is work that um, Alexandra Kasiba, our project coordinator, uh, who was recently moved on to the state of Vermont, had begun uh, several years ago and some work that we had done together over the last couple of years. So really excited to be presenting this webinar today. Uh, as this was a project that started out as a fairly uh, bite-sized effort and has turned into really cool but um, extensive work. So we're excited to have this um, out there and be able to share this with you today. Um, so I uh, just wanted to say before we jump in any further, a little bit of mechanics on the webinar. We are recording this and we'll make it available again online after the webinar is over. Um, I'd ask you, because we are using the Zoom meeting and not the Zoom webinar service, to do a couple things to make it a little bit more webinar-like as we're having this experience. Uh, so please mute your mic and use the Q&A box or the chat box to ask questions. We're lucky to have Jake Van Dersen um, online. Also, he's gonna be monitoring the chat box. If you have any issues with video or audio or um, making use of the meeting software, please put them in there. And he'll also be tracking questions people have throughout the webinar. So if you see something as it comes up, feel free to put it in the chat box and we'll make sure to get back to everything at the end of the webinar. If you want this to be a more webinar-like experience, you can pin my video so that you're always seeing me. Um, there will be uh, some other names showing up there, but just ask you to turn off your video just to reduce the distraction for folks who are participating. Uh, finally, if you're interested in obtaining CFE credits, we were approved for one category one uh, CFE credit through Society of American Foresters. Because you can't physically sign in, we're asking you to make sure that you have set your first and last name properly on your uh, meeting name so that we can use that as an attendance record for the sign-in sheet for SIF. So again, if you uh, need any help on how to do that, please ask Jake so that he can help you make sure that you have your first and last name displayed for those of you seeking CFE credits. So I'll start out by introducing myself. I'm Jim Duncan. I'm the director for the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative. The FEMC is a seven state effort to gather and synthesize data and information about forest ecosystems across the Northeastern region. And we do this uh, through a range of methods and materials, uh, some ranging from uh, actual on the ground monitoring to running cooperative efforts to doing data analysis and synthesis. And one of the ways that we do this work is we work with our state partners to identify issues of need that they have that may not be easy for them to access or engage with while they are in, uh, well, within their constraints and the uh, resources that they have. So we work with our state partners to come up with projects such as these. And this one came up as uh, something of importance to New Hampshire around what the patterns of timber clearing are in the state. When and where has it been occurring? Are we seeing an increasing trend in the amount of clearing that's being done? Uh, what are the patterns by land ownership? What size are the cuts that are being performed? What percentages for land use change versus uh, forest that's gonna be let to regrow uh, in, back into a forested state? So this really is a pretty key question to understanding how the landscape is changing over time and what role forestry and silviculture is playing in that and how this connects to land use conversions on the ground. So one of the major drivers for doing this inventory of clear cutting and forest clearing was to repeat the 1995 inventory that was done uh, at University of New Hampshire. So they had looked at 1980 to 1995, an inventory of clear cuts to see uh, how much had, was being done, what the annual rates were back then. And we were interested in using this project to see what has changed. And it was thought that this could really help inform the forest action planning process and other planning processes that we have going on in the state of New Hampshire. Uh, this kind of information gives us uh, some baseline trend information to compare against and an understanding of how these things are evolving over time. And the uh, overall request came from our state partnership committee members in uh, New Hampshire who work with the Forest Ecosystem Monitoring Cooperative staff to come up with these state directed projects. So this is a state selected project from New Hampshire that we worked on. So today for the webinar, I'm gonna kind of 
take a fairly leisurely walk through some of the steps that we went through and then the findings that came out of each of those steps um, so that we have time to both discuss a little bit about the methods because it's a pretty interesting and publicly accessible data set that can be used for this and then how we uh, went a little bit further than the remote sensing allows us to do to assess accuracy and identify some post-harvest outcomes and intensities. And finally, uh, discuss some of the results around patterns and trends that you can see in the data as a result. So the first step in conducting this inventory of forest clearings was to identify where possible forest clearings have occurred. To do this, we used a global change, a global forest change data set done by Hansen et al. Uh, this is uh, originally published in 2013, but they did an update uh, in their version 1.6 that included imagery and change detection from 2000 to 2018. And what they have done is they've actually identified all uh, forest loss events as well as forest gain. So we focus specifically on the forest loss, which is stand replacing disturbance or a change from forest to non-forest. And they identified for each 30 meter pixel whether or not there had been forest loss during that time. And it also included information about the year in which that forest loss occurred. So you can see here's a zoom in on New Hampshire to show some very patchy uh, pixels. Some are large chunks, clearly a larger scale event happened in those chunks. And then there's some of these more distributed little bits and pieces of disturbance or change being detected in the forest. And this data set's really meant to be used at a regional scale. So it's not meant for site level analysis. Uh, but more to get a sense of how the overall uh, forest change is happening on that landscape. So that meant we had to do a little bit more work to be able to use this. Uh, so to identify clearings, we first had to classify by year, and then we had to group it into polygons and remove any that are less than three acres after that process. So here shows a what the uh, data set may contain for forest loss in a given uh, area. I'm gonna say these are for illustration, not to scale. So each of these pixels is meant to be 30 meters by 30 meters, but the underlying imagery is probably smaller than that. So um, just using this as an example to show the process. So we have these pixels spread out across the landscape. The first thing we did is classified them by year. So we could group them into what year of detection they have. Um, so you can see here we have a group of pixels down here for 2005 uh, adjacent to a harvest that then happened in 2013. Over here this entire area of clearing occurred in 2010 and here's another one that's in 2005. Now to have um, three acres you have to have uh, at least 14 pixels essentially. So we grouped them into polygons uh, just kind of creating these uh, contiguous areas and so we had to have 14 pixels to be considered and thus we remove any that are less than three acres. So even there, even though in this lower right hand corner, you can see an area of forest clearing that uh, altogether was much larger when we considered it by year, only the 2005 section would meet the threshold. And this three acre threshold was chosen because it incorporates, incorporates a large enough number of pixels, but it also matches the threshold used in the 1995 inventory. So we did this for consistency's sake. So what this looks like up close, you can see uh, on the left, we have uh, an intensive cut um, outlined in red, uh, some sort of conversion to agriculture outlined in green. And on the right hand side, you can see where forest was cleared and turned into some sort of parking lot or uh, transportation area. So these are all look the same from the uh, remote sensing data set. They are standard placing disturbance or loss of forest cover that has been uh, captured by this data set, and in most cases, fairly well. And so when you're looking up close, you can see often what it is that generated this change in forest cover. So doing this process, uh, we identified 19,090 polygons that represented 203,000 acres, or 3.9% of the state's forest land that had some sort of clearing in one of these types of categories. Now, this is not all solely clear cutting for silviculture. Obviously some of this is transition to uh, another land use or perhaps some other type of disturbance that creates some sort of forest clearing. But in general, this is some sort of harvesting or reduction in forest cover that we're detecting. Um, just note on the map that it looks like there's a lot of blue, but 
we exaggerated the polygons so you could see kind of the relative density across the landscape, but the actual size and coverage is probably is going to be smaller. So those are exaggerated just to make them visible. The next step that we wanted to do was assess the accuracy of detection. The Remote, data, remote sensing data set itself, as I mentioned, is really useful for a regional scale, but when you're trying to uh, use this for assessing the kind of uh, true patterns and destinations and fates, we want to know how accurate these detections are. Uh, so we did two types of accuracy assessment. The first is, did we fail to detect a clearing that it actually happened? Um, and we did this by comparing it to known silvicultural clear cuts. Uh, this is what we would call our omission error rate. On the right-hand side, you can see a uh, delineated polygon of an actual cut that had been sold and uh, executed and since regrown, but you can see the texture differences um, in that purple outline with a donut hole in the middle. The remote sensing data set is shown in the red squares. Uh, so you can see that the global forest change detection data set did pick up this forest conversion or this forest action, um, but it didn't pick up enough pixels and so this would not be considered a clear cut or a clearing in the remote sensing data set. So we used 241 known clear cuts, primarily on the White, Mas White Mountain National Forest, but also some cuts on state owned lands to go through and evaluate whether they were caught by the remote sensing data set with the three acre threshold that we needed. Um, the results were pretty encouraging. We detected 80%, 88% of the known clear cuts. If you take it by area, it's 91%. And we only completely missed 3%. So in this example that you can see here, this is not a complete miss. We did detect part of it, just not the entire thing. So 3% of that clear cut had been missed by the product. Um, and usually these were small cuts. And uh, if there were any lower intensity cuts, they wouldn't have been missed. So we only used things that were marked as clear cuts. So our Ability to detect cuts is pretty good. This is usually catching all the clear cuts that are being conducted. Um, we're missing a small percentage completely and missing some area overall. So if anything, this method will result in an under detection of clear cut area based on this initial accuracy assessment of emission. The second piece that we did was, did we actually call something a clearing that wasn't a clearing? And so in this case, you can see the global forest change data set picked up a large area of some sort of change. But when we looked at the imagery on the ground, we don't see any evidence of clearing or silvicultural activity or land use conversion. So we were looking to compare historic satellite and aerial imagery for a random subset of those 19,000 polygons to develop what's called a commission error rate or false positives. Uh, we visually inspected imagery for 1,500 random polygons to determine if a cut actually occurred there or not. And based on this, we over-detected by about 2% in count and area. So when we looked through those, of those 1,500, uh, 36 polygons were not cuts and the rest were. Um, and part of this actually could be related to the imagery here because we were using Google Earth imagery and the detection product goes up to 2018. And in some cases, if a cut happened in 2017 or 2018, Google Earth imagery may not be available to, to assess whether the cut actually happened in those years. So we might just be missing the actual uh, imagery of the cut as over, I think, 70% of our uh, commission errors were in 2017 and 2018. So we think this might actually be an issue of validation imagery rather than overzealousness on the part of the detection product. So now that we have a sense of the accuracy of the product, how much it's missing and how much it's, uh, how many false positives it's sending up, we could start looking at intensity and post-harvest outcomes that these polygons uh, show on the landscape. So one aspect that we wanted to look at was likely harvest intensity. As mentioned, this product doesn't really distinguish between uh, moderate disturbance and intense disturbance. So on the left-hand side is a complete clear cut and on the, the right-hand side is uh, a moderate intensity partial tree selection or some sort of uh, mid-grade cut that uh, would not be considered a silvicultural clear cut. This product picks them both up the same. So we wanted to see what percentage of the polygons that we could look at uh, visually were falling into either of these categories. And the criteria we used for a clear cut is a residual basal area of less than 20%, or sorry, less than 20 uh, 
square feet per acre and I think I have that number wrong, sorry, less than 20. And then a, uh, if it was more than 20, it'd be considered a moderate intensity uh, cut. So we used some aerial images uh, that have been developed showing these uh, representative cutoffs, the thresholds, and identified against those. So there's a subjective assessment, but mostly it means if it's in labeled an intensive cut, we could tell it was uh, meeting that residual basal area threshold. If it was uh, unclear to us, we would label it as a moderate intensity cut. So we erred on the side of not calling things clear cuts if they couldn't be verified from the air. So 20 square feet per acre for intensive clearing and greater than 20 square feet per acre for a moderate clearing. And looking at this over time, there is no real trend in either of these. Uh, they seem to uh, be opposite each other, but no significant uh, error. And you can see in the bottom uh, is our error detection. So these are the years that we had polygons detected that weren't actually uh, cuts of some sort. So you can see most of those error detections occurred in 2017 and 2018. And this is again an 8% visual inspection. So we took 8% of the uh, available polygons and performed this uh, intensity assessment on them. The other piece that we did as part of this uh, post-harvest outcome assessment was looking at where these parcels ended up. Did they stay in forest in some way? Did they be regrow or did it look like they were being done as more of a silvicultural treatment rather than a conversion or clearing? So that'd be on the left with forestry. In the middle, we have development. Uh, so here you can see a detection of forest change that was turned into some sort of residential development. And then on the right-hand side, we labeled it agriculture, but it could be any other non-built uh, use. So gravel pits, uh, quarries, fields, agricultural conversion, all labeled as agriculture to bend these into different outcomes. And this is really driven by the interest in, yes, there is lots of clearing going on, but how much of that is actually just forestry based? How much of that is silvicultural clear cutting for some use where the forest will regrow and still stay forest in the long term? So we could stratify the results by county. Uh, you can see here that uh, most of the cutting that we detected appeared to be forestry related of those 1500 polygons. Um, and it varied by county. So Coas and Grafton County uh, have much higher proportions of forestry. Uh, you can see Rockingham and Hillsboro have higher levels of residential conversion happening post-harvest. So not necessarily surprising, but it confirms what we might expect the purpose of these cuts to be across the landscape where Southern New Hampshire sees more uh, conversion related clearing than Northern New Hampshire does. So lastly, after developing these initial accuracy assessments and then the uh, assessment of the post-harvest outcome, we could look more into the patterns and trends that were, that were emerging from the data. So first to look at the total area cleared in this 2000 to 2018 period by county, uh, you could see concentrations in Merrimack, Grafton, and Coas County. Uh, with COAS representing the largest area uh, cleared, the largest clear single cut size, and the largest annual rate of clearing. But it's also, I think, worth looking at the rates of clearing. So you can see in this graphic on the right, we're showing the percent of the county forest land that area that's been cleared um, per year. So how much is being cleared per year. Uh, and different picture, so where forest is more scarce, we're actually seeing a higher rate of, of clearing happening in some of those more populated areas than you might see in the uh, center two counties in Carroll and Grafton. Uh, so the rates kind of differ from the total amounts, which is to be expected when you have areas that are more forested compared to others. Over time, uh, the Average cut size is shown in the dashed line on top, and the total area cut per year is shown in the solid orange line. And we see the average cut size generally uh, oscillating around some stable median, seeming to respond somewhat to uh, 2008 recession. But the orange uh, 
total area per year does have a significantly positive trend. Uh, so it is increasing. So there is overall the rates increasing a little bit each year. So this was an interesting finding. Um, though it looks messy, there is a steady upward tick in the area being cleared per year. Uh, on average, taking all the changes happened, there's about 0.2% of New Hampshire's forest land being cleared per year of about 11,000 acres, and that rate appears to be increasing over time. We also examined where these cuts are occurring based on ownership. Uh, so the vast majority, or 80%, of the forest clearing that's happening in the state is happening on private non-conserved lands, followed by lands owned by the state of New Hampshire, and then conservation organizations in the White Mountain National Forest. So when we think about where these cuts have been occurring over the last 18 years, uh, we're seeing it's heavily concentrated in private non-conserved lands. And the size of cuts is very much tilted towards smaller cut sizes based on the clearing data that we identified. So you can see that the bulk of these cuts are less than 10 acres in size, um, and very, very few cuts are greater than uh, 50 acres in size across the state. So the work that we did on assessing the accuracy, we feel pretty confident that we're detecting most of the shape. We're not getting cuts split up in size. So these larger cuts generally are not are around the order of 200 to 400 acres, and there's not very many of them. Looking at the uh, fate of these, so this is showing the area for each of the 1,500 polygons and what trajectory they ended up in, whether they went to development or agriculture or they stayed in forest. Um, there is no real trend in the agricultural realm or the development realm that's significant, but we did see a uh, general increase in the ones that are being uh, conducted for forestry. So if we extrapolate the forest land conversion in these areas to greater than three acres that we're seeing uh, 2,300 acres per year or 0.04% of forest land uh, being converted. So that's land that was forest turned into non-forest either as, as one of these conversions. Now we only looked at 1,500 polygons, so 10% or 8% is a pretty good sample. Um, there's definitely some potential for error in this extrapolation. So while we give these numbers for conversion, uh, they are really based on just a subset of the overall uh, clearings that we inventory. And this is also lower than what uh, New Hampshire had reported in 2010 in their uh, forest resource assessment. So the conversion rates uh, based solely on this product look to be a little bit lower than what that report had given, but maybe a little bit uh, more in line with what's been found in something like the Woodlands and Wildlands Partnership uh, reports that have come out. So this tool could be used to look at some conversion, but uh, it's maybe would need a little bit more uh, assessment of some of those polygons, to, some additional polygons to make sure that the conversion rates aren't just representing some oddities in the data. And then as we remember, the first uh, reason to do this was to compare it to the 1995 inventory. So the first one had looked at really closely in at clear cuts in particular, not any sort of forest clearing. So they only assessed clear cuts that met that residual basal area threshold. Um, because of the limitations in the data product we had available, we had to include both moderate and intensive harvests. So in comparing these, you really have to keep that fundamental piece in mind that they were using aerial imagery interpretation and uh, some field validation to only assess clear cuts, whereas we are using a remote sensing product and then trying to figure out how many intensive cuts it's detecting after the fact. Largest cut that they detected was 700 acres. Um, the largest cut that was detected in this inventory is 445 acres. This is one where probably the methods don't make much of a difference because the larger contiguous areas of change are much easier to identify. So it's a lot less likely that there's a large cut that was missed by the 2000 to 2018 inventory. So this does seem to be a change where we, have, we don't have cuts that are happening as large as they were back in the 80s and early 90s. The 95 inventory uh, estimated an annual rate sorry, a total clearing of 49,000 acres across 1,700 cuts, 
um, including these both moderate and intensive harvests, we identified 103,000 acres of clearing across 19,000 polygons for forestry, residential, and agricultural conversion use. Uh, the rate of cutting, as would be expected, is lower in the 95 inventory. Um, when we looked at just at intensive cuts, it was still higher in the 2000 to 2018 inventory. So this is where if we take those percentages of the visually inspected polygons and say, and apply that to the entire data set, we're estimating about 6,000 acres per year happening in intensive cuts. So possibly there's just more intensive cutting happening now. That's one option, one reason that there's an increase. A second increase reason could be that our method is over detecting intensive cuts among that sample and we're extrapolating too much, um, which is certainly possible. The third option, a third possible explanation is that the initial inventory missed some clear cuts that uh, actually happened on the ground. We do know there's some that were not caught by the 95 inventory when we were looking back at the historical imagery. So it's certainly possible that there's cuts in from 1980 to 1995 that are not included in the inventory. So their estimate may be lower than what was actually happening on the ground. It would take more work to figure out which of those three things is happening. Uh, finally, uh, we did look at Coas County in particular, sorry, it says country, Coas County, 64% uh, of clear cuts from the 1995 inventory occurred in Coas County, while only 35% of all cuts occurred in Coas County in the 18 inventory. So uh, partly that's because we're detecting a lot more uh, moderate intensity cuts and non-silvicultural cuts, but uh, their cutting is and clearing is spread out uh, more widely across the landscape in the 2018 inventory. So that's the end of our outline of trends. Uh, this data and information is all available to be explored through an online ArcGIS map that we've put up. So you can go to the URL on the bottom um, and see all of the polygons that were extracted from this product and uh, what their year of cut was. And we added a couple of features to this tool to make it easier to use without having to download a bunch of heavy spatial data and start processing it there. Um, so one uh, feature on the bottom you can see is actually a time slider. So you can play a uh, time lapse map to see how cladding occurred over time on the landscape. Um, you can also access some charting tools and some spatial limiting tools. So here I just zoomed in on an area and you can select an area of interest and uh, draw a polygon around it and then develop charts of how the uh, cutting acreage has evolved over time. So here you can see for everything that's highlighted in green, uh, the year of the cut that those took place. Um, so these can be done by year, by county, uh, and that data is all available in an online map explorer that makes it easy to interact with this content and provides a little bit more information about the data. The other place that we've put information is on our uh, project and dataset archive on the FEMC. So you can access uh, the data sets, you can access uh, related documents and images and other content that's available uh, from this project is all online and immediately downloadable so that uh, we can make this information as easy to access as possible. Um, so you can access the underlying data sets, the spatial data sets that were used to create this product. Uh, so again, just zooming back out, major takeaways based on this assessment, about 0.2% of New Hampshire's forest land per year is being cleared in some moderate or intensive fashion. That equates to about 11,000 acres a year um, and maybe 6,000 acres per year of intensive harvesting, uh, extrapolating out from a sample. On average, the cuts are about 11 acres, um, and 80% of those cuts are occurring for silviculture. Uh, so they're uses that go back to forestry, they don't uh, convert to another use. And then as we showed, it's clearly a private land phenomenon. 80% of these cuts are happening on private land. And the location variability, I didn't talk about it too much in the original presentation, but the, uh, the kind of cl clustering and distribution of cutting really varies depending on which county, which part of the state you're looking at. Um, so there is this variability in location that we found pretty interesting. And we 
do see some positive uh, significant trends increasing the amount of uh, intensive cutting as well as conversions. So, um, sorry, as well as uh, overall cutting. And while that amount is increasing, it may not be land use change that's driving it because we are seeing this increase in forestry related cutting in particular. So uh, there's more that could be dug into with these pieces, but this is some of, these are some of the major patterns that we uh, have extracted from this project. Um, I wanted to say thanks, uh, Kyle Lombard and Brad Simpkins from New Hampshire Department of Natural and Cultural Resources, uh, really spent a lot of time with us on this project, providing uh, additional uh, insight and uh, expertise. They provide us with data and help uh, understand how we could do this project to make it work and inform the New Hampshire's uh, Department of Forest and Lands in their work. Um, I'd also like to thank Katie White and Roger Boyle with the White Mountain National Forest. They spent a lot of time with us going through their clear-cut data uh, so that we had some great uh, content to compare against. Um, the USDA Forest Service Easter and or Eastern Region State and Private Forestry uh, provides our funding along with the University of Vermont and the Vermont Department of Forest Parks and Recreation. And just a shout out again to Ali Kasiba who did the bulk of this work and really brought this project to completion. Um, so I know that she couldn't give this presentation today, but we're really thankful for all the work she did on this project in particular. So with that, uh, that brings me to the end of the talk. Um, I hope that if you have questions, you've been putting them in the chat box, so you can do that now. Um, Jake is going to come on and walk us through the questions to make sure that we don't miss any. And uh, feel free to um, raise your hand or signal to Jake if you wanna have a follow-up on any of these. We don't have too many people on the meeting, so I think it is possible if people wanna have more of a conversation, we have enough time. Uh, that people could ask verbal questions, but let's start out trying to use the chat box just to make sure that we don't miss any questions to begin with. So with that, I thank you so much for your attention and I'll open it up to questions. Hi Jim, so we have a couple few questions that are coming in in the chat box and to all who can't see the chat box, if you would click on the three dots in the lower, in the bottom of your screen that says more, um, and you can bring up the chat room and you can ask your questions there and please address your questions to everyone. Uh, first question from Rich Carbonetti. Did the study account for the impacts of the 1998 ice storm and how much of this clearing quotes was related to the ice storm salvage, which is a unique driver? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so this is purely a stand replacing change. So if there was a if there was vegetation that, if there was green leaves on the trees in uh, 1998 before the ice storm and then they were gone in the 1999 post ice storm world, those would show up, those would have showed up as a disturbance but prior to the start of this uh, data set. So the data set we were using said in 2000, this is a forest led landscape based on the greenness of the leaves on the trees. And if there was then a change that was attributed to 2001, because there's some sort of change that happened between 2000 and 2001. So I'm not familiar with the, to the extent of the harvesting, the post uh, ice storm salvage harvesting that happened. If there was salvage harvesting happening after 2000 that was taking down green trees, then that would be detected as part of this product. Based on the numbers, I don't think that it is included. I'm just going back to the time, the over time slide. I think I missed it um, just to see, but I don't think that that will have been caught in this because um, because we're not going to see dead trees being taken down. It's only going to be live trees. And looking here at the forest clearing over time, um, there is it starts out high and then dips to 2003, but it's not. I don't think, I would suspect it's not reflecting a massive amount of harvesting after the ice storm. Awesome, so second question coming from also Rich Carbonetti. The CT Lakes tract is a dominant parcel in Coas County and it has 146,000 acre easement. Where does that fit in the presentation of where harvesting is occurring? So I'm not familiar with that tract in particular. Um, 
if you were to go to the map viewer, you could explore that, knowing where it is, you could explore that area. Um, again, similar to the comments before, if there is any removal of, a significant removal of green biomass from the landscape during this time, it'll be caught in that area. Now, if we were assessed that area using aerial imagery and it was being managed as silviculture where trees are being replanted or regrown after the clearing, then that would show up in this kind of forestry related uh, harvesting activity or clearing activity as opposed to a conversion. So if those polygons randomly selected fell in that area, we would include that as kind of a silvicultural management. Great. Um, so next question from Chris Fife. How is conserved forest land, quote, defined, sorry, defined, and does this include conservation easement land? That is a great question. I would have to go back to, I can't remember off the top of my head where the source was for the conserved lands data set, um, but it was a, yeah, I'd have to go back and look. Um, it's in the report that's linked online. Uh, it, there was a single data set that we used to define conserved lands. I would guess that it does not include easement land and that it probably only includes fee ownership land, but that would be a guess um, based on my experience with other conservation data sets. So if there is a New Hampshire wide data set that includes conserved easements, we would have used it, but I'm, I'm guessing we didn't. So conserved land in this case would be land owned fee title by conservation organizations, um, unless I am wrong, but I'm pretty sure that's right for the conserved lands data. Great, and uh, Chris, yes, we'll provide the links in a email and also put them at the bottom of this chat. Um, and to address the next question from Margaret, um, will this data set be used to examine the extent of forest fragmentation or connectivity? That is a really good question. Um, one slide I didn't include in this presentation actually kind of alludes to that. Um, so I'm putting it up on the screen now where we have, uh, you can see where forests are kind of remnant forests on the left here. Um, this may not provide like an ecological landscape connectivity functionality to the data set, but you can see harvesting in this area is particularly uh, impactful for the earlier successional forest available in the area, plus potential for land use change conversion pressures. Um, and on the right hand side, you can see where clearing has been happening across the landscape in areas that might be forest blocks or uh, larger key intact areas of forest landscape that's being converted. Now, if these are silvicultural clear cuts and they're creating early successional forest that has a role in the forest as well. Um, so the question of whether this can be used to assess forest fragmentation really depend on whether you consider fragmentation to be purely about cover or if you consider it to be about the permanent con conversion to other uses. Um, I don't think this data set is in and of itself enough to look at conversion to other uses. I think there's other pieces of information we would need to bring in from forest inventory and analysis um, and other uh, wildland urban interface data sets that are being developed uh, to look at kind of the use conversion because this really is all about cover. Um, if we were to go back and actually visually inspect all 19,000 polygons, uh, then I would feel more comfortable saying you could use this to look at land conversion because you could really say what's the fate of pretty much every polygon that we detect as change. Um, it's not a trivial undertaking, but it's certainly possible to go back and do that assessment or to take this uh, online data set, grab the polygons for the area you're interested in, and then go do those visual assessments with free software uh, on your own is certainly an option too. Um, but I think the... Uh, yeah, the, the, we only assessed 8% of the polygons, so using these numbers and extrapolating it to the entire set of clear cuts or clearings would be uh, potentially problematic. Um, but it certainly picks up these conversions and this change from forest to non-forest. And if we know where our key forest blocks and our connectivity blocks are occurring, uh, we can use this to at least tip us off if there's an area that we need to go and look into more detail. So if you were to update this inventory on a regular basis, you could actually use uh, your map of current forest cover, your map of key habitat blocks and key connectivity blocks and corridors, and then say, and then actually assess like, oh, there's been a lot of clearing in this area. We should take a closer look to see what type of clearing it has been. 
So that could be a potential use as more for a tip off of areas you want to look into more closely over time. Okay, thank you, Jim. Uh, next question from Peter Smolage. If the goal is to understand harvesting activity, example, aerial extent and harvest frequency, would this type of satellite analysis be an effective way to document harvesting after the fact versus, for example, a state requirement for harvest notification? Um, I don't believe this data set is appropriate for harvest activity monitoring because it's coarse. Um, it ends up being pretty accurate. Uh, as far as we know, this is the first use of this data set in the North, Northeast. But because the pixel size is 30 meters and because the authors themselves caution against using this for site level analysis, I wouldn't recommend using this for site level monitoring. Um, I think it was a great tool for getting a sense of general patterns by town or county um, and quantifying trends and rates over time. There are other remote sensing products coming online, such as Sentinel, which has a much finer resolution. You can get a one meter pixel instead of, a, sorry, a 10 meter pixel instead of a 30 meter pixel. So you can get better definition, actually see you know, the difference between lawns and houses and backwoods um, in that data set. And that's a type of data set that would be more appropriate to use for this kind of detection. But as far as I know, no one's doing that kind of automated processing of Sentinel yet. So that would be a new effort. Um, again, this could tip you off to areas that you should investigate more. So you could look for where the general clearing has been happening and then identify known harvest from tax reporting or that kind of thing to look at the extents. Um, but you'd ultimately have to rely on something more like visual imagery or Sentinel-2 to, to confirm or deny what the 30 meter product is telling you. So it's again, it's like a good course filter, but for site level harvest outcome monitoring, I wouldn't use that. Great, so uh, moving to the next question um, from Wendy Weisiger. There is a New Hampshire statewide, um, sorry, <laughs> it's just a statement. There is a New Hampshire statewide Consland data set. Um, next question from Sean Brestenham. You had a slide of acres cleared by ownership. Was this for the 2000 to 2018 timeframe? Let's get back there. Um, yes, so this is the, from the area 2000 to 2018, we took all the polygons and where their centers fell. So we had the ownership boundary, which was that conservation land. Thank you for putting that in the comments, by the way. Yes, the Pond's Land data set. Um, I still don't know whether that was uh, easement or fee simple. Um, but the ownership patterns here were if the center of the polygon fell in the ownership, then we called it in that ownership entirely. So it's possible that you had a total timber harvest that could have been crossing ownership boundaries, but uh, we would have classified, or county boundaries, but we classified it uh, based on where the center of the, the cut fell, just to simplify the reporting a little bit. So yeah, this is showing the ownership breakdown by uh, for the 2000 to 2018 inventory. Awesome, so the next question also from Rich Carbonetti. Have these conversion, harvest, et cetera results been compared with the targets for the production of early successional habitat as that habitat type continues to shrink in the region? That's a great question, Penn. Everyone anticipated the slides I didn't include. Um, so we did look at this uh, as one potential use for this. Um, so we can take the rates that we estimate from this. Uh, again, these estimates are based on only 8% of the sample. But if you assess that there's about 6,000 acres per year of intensive clearings uh, that remain 80% in are for silvicultural purposes, that means that our silvicultural clear cutting is creating about 5,000 acres a year in early successional forests, which is only 0.08%, um, I think well below uh, the targets for early successional forest creation in the state. So if the, based on this data set and the small number of samples that we looked at um, for effect for the post-harvest outcome, uh, silvicultural clear cutting from 2000 to 2018 is not creating that much early successional forest across the state. 
So we would be looking at what is that um, almost a thousand years to over turn over all the forest. So it's not going to be uh, very, it's not going to get us to early successional forest goals. We haven't looked at how that breaks down by ownership. That would be a really interesting thing to do if we assessed more polygons for their fate. And then also looked at that by ownership to see which ownerships are contributing to the development of early successional forest. And then to the other qu question comment about um, fragmentation in key forest blocks, like how does that intersect with some of these habitat goals that we have on the landscape? I think there's some really interesting options there. Great, so there is a little bit confusion between two questions, um, between the question Rich asks and Chris, and I invite Rich to turn on his microphone for a minute if he would like and um, address this um, issue um, if he can. Um, sorry, here's another question from him. What category do conservation ease lands fit under? So, uh, Rich, did you want to ask more of a question on with your mic? Yeah, if, can you hear me? Um, yeah, the, the question is where do conservation ease lands fit into the land ownership? Because you have private, non-conserved as that large uh, element on the chart, and a big significant component of that land is already under conservation easement might be certified under uh, third party green certification, but a lot of it has actual, you know, deeded conservation easements on it. And I'm just wondering, that seems to be a pretty vigorous breakout category that would be useful to see how that fits into this matrix of your assessment. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, was it Maggie who put that note about the cons lands? database because that would be my that's where I'd have to go for the answer is what if the conservation lands data set provides spatial boundaries of easements that aren't fee simple ownership then yes we could break that out we would have lumped all the fees simple with the um, easement lands but I don't my suspicion is that we don't have those easement boundaries if we had them we could certainly go back and look at what portion of private ownership that's under easement is delivering these types of actions versus non-easement ownership. So I, I'd have to go back to the, uh, the cons date lands data set and look at that to make sure, but I'm pretty sure it doesn't include easements and that would be lumped into the private land category. And the, the reason that's important is that those lands would literally never be uh, able to be converted to other uses. So it would really fine tune uh, from a standpoint of assessment, what lands are being potentially converted uh, to, to tighten up that assessment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, when we think about our oppor not opportunity, but like what's available, uh, what the supply could be, um, it'd be a very different picture. Thank you. Yeah, thanks for those questions, Rich. All right, thank you, Rich. Thank you for clarifying there. Um, another question from Maggie. Did the takeaways of this inventory match expectations? When will the forest action plan discussions begin? Do you know how this data will be used? Uh, so for the first question, did the takeaways match expectations? Um, we went through so many iterations of the actual data source for this that uh, we were just excited to get to look at patterns. I think when we started to see where these harvests were happening, if you look at the map, you see kind of the white sort of hole in cutting, uh, we saw more, uh, intensive cutting and larger scale cutting in the north. Um, we saw the residential conversion that we would have expected in some of these areas and actually pretty amazing granularity for detecting you know, the development of a neighborhood um, that didn't exist two years earlier. So I think that the relative spread of where these harvests are happening um, was, it, it matched kind of the a priori expectations we had. Um, I think the biggest challenge I have with this is the mismatch between the 1995 and the 2018 inventory. And that's where we're just hampered by, we can't easily sort out what's intensive clear cutting versus what's uh, moderately intensive harvesting. So um, because we can't really easily compare to the 95 inventory, I think that's a challenge um, where I'd hope that we would have been able to do better. Uh, but that's, 
that was one expectation I had hoped to have where we could compare intensive clear cutting between these two time periods more easily. Um, as far as I know, the forest action plan discussions are well underway. The data compilation has been ongoing. Um, I don't know that the forest advisory board, which works on that process with Division of Forest Lands, has begun work on that yet. Um, but I know that the planning process is underway. So before doing this webinar and finalizing this report, we circulated it to our partners at the state. Um, so they have it and I hope that they'll be uh, you, using this to understand kind of what their overall rates of, of harvesting and conversion are. And this complements or sits alongside other work that's being done by folks at UNH on kind of the forest land definition changes in the state. How much forest land are we losing, not just forest cover? So I think this is one data point to help understand what the trends have been and see where we might be hitting targets or may not be hitting targets. Um, so I'm hoping that the data can be used to gut check what people are are saying it's happening and what we're seeing on the ground and what we're seeing from the sky so that we get this better holistic view of how forests have been managed and harvested over the last 20 years. Great, thank you, Jim. Looks like we have addressed the questions in the chat box. Um, we, I have posted the link to the data set for NH Forest Clearing as well as a link to the interactive map, um, just a few chats back so please um, type in those links if you want to access those and we will also follow up um, via email. Perfect well I want to thank everyone for uh, making the time to be here and for the great questions I really appreciate it this has been um, exciting to put out there but even more exciting to kind of hear how people are thinking about this product uh, so we'll be putting up um, information on our site and following up with you all to provide links afterwards in case you want to view the video again or access a presentation or share this with anyone else. And if you have any follow-up questions, feel free to reach out to me directly. My email is on our website and then up on the screen now. Um, so I would welcome any follow-up conversation about this. Uh, with that, stay self safe, stay healthy, and uh, thanks so much for everything you're doing. Take care.